I'm so pleased to have Chris on our team. He is the uh, central director um, for the Texas Council as well. And he's doing a great job, you know, driving the mission in the, in the central part of the state. I mean, there's probably six or seven clubs um, in that area that he's responsible for and checking in on. Um, great part of our expo, but I'm really, really thrilled tonight to have Chris Johnson come talk to us from Living Waters Fly Shop. And Chris is also our newest casting instructor, certified casting instructor in the Federation of Fly Fishers. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you all. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bill, you were talking about uh, barbed wire, no trespassing. I think uh, I was just telling, I said, if you're not hearing gunshots or banjos, it's too public. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, like Russell said, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about the Guadalupe River tonight. And uh, we'll have time for questions at the end of this, because I do want to take time to answer as many questions as I can about the fishery. Uh, I do feel like the Guadalupe River is a fishery that is oftentimes misunderstood and often uh, fairly unappreciated for what it really represents and uh, really the potential that it holds. Uh, so if you have a question and you have a notepad or something, jot it down or tuck it in your memory banks, tell your neighbor next to you to punch you when it's time to ask questions and uh, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. The Guadalupe River is really kind of an amazing place in the sense that it is the southernmost trout fishery in the United States. Now, when a lot of folks think about Texas stalker trout fishing, it involves Texas Parks and Wildlife, about 9 to 12 inch long fish, a bunch of marshmallows, cheese, and salmon eggs, and uh, a bunch of people with uh, H-E-B and Walmart bags, and we call those grocery store fishermen, so they're out there, uh, they're out there drowning their grocery products trying to catch uh, some representation thereof of a trout. While the Guadalupe does have a little bit of that in certain sections of the river, it is the only special trout regulation that we have in Texas. And we actually now, uh, as of this year, have had some new regulation changes on the river, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, with this, this is kind of a fairly typical portrait of a wintertime Guadalupe River fishery, and you can see that there are a fair amount of people crowded one, around one little hole. And there's a bunch of folks that fish the river, they see that one time and are completely turned off by the fishery, and uh, that's all that lodges in their mind. However, there are many places on the river where you won't see anybody above you or below you, and you've got the river to yourself with rainbow trout that are well in excess of 20 inches. Um, you know, most of you, the, the lower mountain fork is right about three hours away from where we're sitting or something about that close, and I fish it often and guide it as well. The thing that really differentiates the two fisheries is, one, you have obviously the brown trout in the lower mountain fork. You get a lot of numbers up there. The Guadalupe River, we do have, uh, I'd say, a little bit of corner on the market for size. There are some phenomenally large fish there that I think you encounter on a more frequent basis than you would in the Lower Mountain Fork. Now, the Lower Mountain Fork grows a larger fish overall once they've been in the river a while, as evidenced by the state record of 17 pounds for a brown trout. But uh, for the Guadalupe River, we do have some uh, very, very nice rainbows that do make it from year to year. Just a typical Central Texas River scene. Uh, a lot of folks pretty much in their trout season uh, as the weather warms and spring arrives. Uh, I actually am one of the people that do not. Uh, I fish for trout all the way throughout the summer in the Guadalupe River. Now that may sound like heresy and that may sound like an impossibility. I assure you it's not. And we'll have uh, pictures that tell you quite otherwise. Uh, interesting, interesting topography of the region. It's really kind of incredible because uh, this river has cut its way through uh, this riverbed for hundreds and thousands of years. The thing that's really funny, if you look on the left hand side here, and I apologize if these people are in the room, I don't really, I don't remember who it was, um, but on that left side you can see all the little caves and pockets in that limestone cliff there. Well, uh, right in the middle of the photo you can see one dead tree right in the center of the river. Uh, I had a guide trip uh, several years ago and we were coming down the river, had a decent amount of flow, and the river kind of makes a hard right upstream from uh, where this picture is taken. And so we drop in on these cliffs and I have a husband and wife in the boat, and uh, the wife's in the front of the boat, and she goes, oh, sucks half the oxygen out of the world, and uh, looks at the cliffs and goes, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful, what made this? I was like, uh, God or water erosion, one of the two, I mean, you know, mix thereof, something like that. Those are the <laughs> obvious answers, and once again, I apologize if this is anybody in the room, but I think this is the funniest thing that's ever happened to me on the river. Um, 
I then began to tell her, I said, well, ma'am, actually, that's kind of a sad story, how those caves were formed. She goes, excuse me? I said, well, what you're looking at is uh, the ancient dwellings of the Guadalupe River cave monkey. <laughs> and uh, I said, a lot of people don't know this, but it was uh, the U.S.'s only native primate. I said, uh, very intelligent species, knew how to, to differentiate between flint and limestone in the river bottom. So all of these little caves and pockets were actually hand-hewn dwellings by these Guadalupe River cave monkeys. The colony existed for thousands of years. It's the only, uh, only occurrence we have of this in the U.S. and in Central Texas. I said, it's very, very rare. I said, you're looking at the last remaining evidence that they, you know, that we have proof that they ever existed. She's like, really? I was like, yes, ma'am. And uh, I, I, I didn't think she was going to go for it. But anyway, we kept going and talking about how they're a communal species, how, you know, the, the little bitty dwellings were a single monkey as they, you know, made it and had families. They'd expand the dwelling, and that's what the longer ones were from. Talked about how they clean and caught their food. And she turns around and goes, well, do we still have them? I was like, well, uh... Actually, that's the sad part of the story. I said in 1848 when the first settlers arrived, I said uh, they were enthralled by the monkeys and had never seen a primate as most of our ancestors originated from Europe and they never were exposed to something like that. I said so uh, they began to trap the monkeys and the Native Americans that actually called this area home revered them as sacred and so they never hunted, trapped, or harvested them in any, any way, shape, or form. And uh, that, you know, that sort of sacred, uh, you know, reverence that was, you know, obviously part of the Native American culture was very much depicted in... Uh, you know, pictographs and things like that on cave walls all across the state. And I said, uh, with this, I said, the settlers found that the monkeys were very easily domesticated. I said, and so they began to trap and harvest, and I said, and eventually they were wiped out in extinction. I said, the last evidence that we have ever recorded, I said, was in 1872 when the last naturalist came to the area and sketched the one sketch of the last remaining monkey in this colony. I said, and that final sketch is the only proof outside of these dwellings that we have that those cave monkeys exist. I thought she was going to cry. And uh, she looks at the caves, breathless, looks back at me and goes, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. All those monkeys gone in less than 50 years. And she turns, and they make these wonderful things in fly fishing called buffs that you can put up over your face and you can wear sunglasses. Nobody has an idea what your facial expression is doing. So when the, when the guide's sitting there going, oh my gosh. That was the most horrible cast I've ever seen in my life. You just look like you're smiling the whole time because they can't see what's behind the buff. So the thing is, she looks at me and goes, I can't believe it. I said, ma'am, neither can I. She pauses and looks downstream, looks back up at the cliffs and turns around and goes, that wasn't a true story, was it? I said, no, ma'am, not a word. So her husband gets the prize, though, because he was a perfect gentleman and said absolutely nothing. So, moving on. The Guadalupe River, very unique place, uh, as evidenced by uh, flora and fauna and cave monkeys. So uh, you know a little bit of the history of the Guadalupe River now that uh, probably very few people in this state know. Uh, whether it is true or not is for you to uh, determine. The Guadalupe River really does boast a phenomenal amount of fish, not just trout, but also you have many other species that call the river home. Um, cliff walls, bird species, we see birds migrate through there that are you know, very, very seldom seen in other parts of the state. Uh, the cypress has obviously taken on a nice orange about this time of year. They're just now starting to turn. Uh, and if you don't think there's any trout in the river after summer, i got more news for you. We've got them. And uh, that, that's a fairly large fish. It's especially a fairly large fish for 5X and a size 22. Um, you know, I mean, we, we can keep going. I mean, there's, there's a lot of large fish. Uh, that little girl, a uh, very good friend of mine, Lance there, and his daughter, uh, Daisha, she caught a fish that wasn't just a whole lot smaller than that one. And then, uh, you know... This is this kid's biggest trout ever, and I mean, we're looking at, that's happening in Central Texas. So, I mean, it's really just a phenomenal place to see these fish grow up. They do make it from year to year, and uh, we, we do call those holdovers, and that's not like, uh, it, it's kind of an interesting term that we've assigned to these fish, but holdover trout are simply ones that over summer and make it into the following year. Now, there are many, many trout stocked in the river each, you know, trout season, which normally kicks off about mid-November. But these fish will make it all the way through spring and summer, especially in the upper portions of the river. Uh, but they are gorgeous fish. You'll see some that, uh, as you, you can kind of see the difference. As they come out of the hatchery, they're a little bit more chrome. You start to see them really get uh, a lot of color back when they uh, really feed on natural diets and really adapt to the river. And you start seeing, you can see the uh, anal and pectoral, or excuse me, anal and pelvic fin there starting to change color. If you look real close in the photo, you can see the white tips on those fins. Another very good indication that that fish has taken up a natural diet and has been in the river for a while. Uh, oddly enough, we catch fish that look like this in one spot on the river that's 15 miles away from the dam, and we fish it every year and find fish that look like this. That, and some of them are caught before the trout ever gets stocked in the river. How a trout is making it 15 miles away from the dam when 
surrounding water temperatures are easily 80 degrees in that section of the river, I will never know. Uh, there's some cold springs that kind of show up in parts of this river that over summer trout in just very limited pockets. So this is one of those places where I think we have some of that. Um, interesting things about the rainbow trout that we stock in the Guadalupe River. So there are two organizations that are very responsible uh, for putting trout in the river. Texas Parks and Wildlife you're all familiar with. Um, they do a great job of spreading the wealth all throughout the river. Typically a smaller fish. I've seen them down to four or five inches. I've seen them up to about 13, 14 is about the size range that Texas Parks puts in there. Uh, and they put thousands of them in the river uh, every single year. Uh, there are a lot of them that are put into put and take type fishery areas on the Guadalupe River, but also many are released into the actual trophy zone. The other entity that is responsible for stocking a lot of the larger fish in the Guadalupe River is Guadalupe River Trout Unlimited. Uh, and if you are a member of Trout Unlimited and live in Texas, congratulations, we are your home chapter. Uh, I'm also the VP of membership for them, so if you're having a uh, lease access problem, you're probably going to wind up calling me sometime this season. So uh, the thing about GRTU that does, they do such a great job of uh, putting really great fish in the river. We see a lot of fish over summer. And the other thing is they just really fight tooth and nail for the water that flows through that river. They've negotiated low flow agreements uh, with Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. They do such a phenomenal job of spreading fish up and down the river, and uh, they even have a private lease access, uh, a lease access program that allows you, I think it's this year, 19 different sites up and down the river that you have access to, so uh, really a phenomenal program uh, to be involved with. Uh, and a lot of folks don't know that it is the largest chapter of Trout Unlimited in the world with over 5,000 members. Uh, most small towns in Texas don't even boast that population. Um, once again, beautiful fish. Very, very worthy of your time, and uh, I really do enjoy getting to go to the Guadalupe River that, in all honesty, I can be on the water from the fly shop in an hour and 15 minutes. In the heat of summer, when it's 111 degrees for a high, to be able to drive down the road and hop in water that's in the upper 50s, lower 60s, and be able to catch these guys in the middle of summer, that's just unheard of in Texas. It just doesn't happen. And we have a lot of people that even fish the river on a regular basis that don't even know you can do that in the middle of summer. And while there are some right and wrong ways to do it, uh, I assure you, if you take care of your fish and you're very careful at handling them during the summertime, uh, you will see great trout success. Another benefit of the Guadalupe River is the bycatch. We do have a lot of fish that show up that aren't trout. Um, that is not a trout. Uh, if you have been in this club more than about a day or two, I should hope you know the difference. That is kind of our Texas mainstay right there. The largemouth bass. There's plenty of those and they get decent size. Also one of the places in Texas where there is still a decent population of smallmouth. Uh, thanks to Texas Parks and Wildlife, they are you know, now bringing back the Guadalupe bass in many places where uh, smallmouth were introduced and were uh, hybridizing with the species. Um, but these smallmouth are gorgeous. Um, that is a really beautiful photo and the fish ain't bad either. Uh, now that's my wife, so it's okay, I can say that kind of stuff. So she, uh, she outfishes me on a regular basis and she does let me know about it. Uh, some of the smallmouth get pretty dang large. So I mean that's, uh, you know what's odd, out of all these bass, that's the biggest one we have in this presentation, it was caught on a size 22 midge. And it's actually lip hook. We didn't just like accidentally, you know, that thing, I, I'm hoping it just breathed it in. Because if it actually ate that, that fish has got some things really wrong with it. Um, but it's a phenomenal place. And where do you see doubles like that in Texas? Nowhere else but the Guadalupe River. That is really an interesting combination right there to have uh, really anywhere uh, across the country. That's a fun combination. The thing I like about that, that's not a shabby trout. That, that trout's probably 14, 15 inches. Uh, that bass ain't shabby either. So, uh, and the bass actually took a smaller fly than the trout did. Sunfish, dime a dozen. We have a bunch of them. Um, if you'll look, the red breast sunfish in the Guadalupe River really do obtain uh, very, very good size. This one here, uh, if you'll look, the 12 inch mark on that rod is on the uh, left hand side of the photo, and the 20 inch is just above my name there on the blank. And the tail's folded over and it's slanting away from the rod. So, I mean, that's a pretty substantial sunfish. And uh, I think that's a size six streamer in its jaw, too. So, uh, they're not scared. Another little oddball species that we find on the Guadalupe River, rock bass. There's about three places in Texas that you will regularly encounter these, and that's the San Marcos River, the Comal River, and the Guadalupe River. So this is one of the main three rivers that we have in Central Texas that you're really going to encounter these. Typically more of an Ozark and uh, kind of an Eastern species, really, in some regards. But the good old goggle eye occasionally shows up for us. Now that's a fish that is ugly as sin, but that is really an interesting species to have in our Central Texas Hill Country. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to make the argument of whether the, the uh, carp is the golden bonefish or not, 
but nonetheless, this thing right here runs like crazy. And this is a red horse sucker. If we didn't have trout in the Guadalupe River, it would be the single best red horse sucker fishery that we have in Central Texas. Uh, and oddly enough, when they spawn in, in uh, about March every year, March to early April, uh, we see them bed up, and the trout get in behind them and pick up their eggs. So it's, uh, if you find these guys, a lot of times you'll find uh, those guys right next to them. So another interesting little double there. Uh, both of those very worthy opponents on a fly rod. That sucker will outrun that trout, and uh, they're a little bit better at throwing their weight around. They don't jump, but they uh, definitely throw their weight around. Let's not talk about how hard it was to get that picture. But uh, <laughs> with that, insects on the Guadalupe River. Obviously, in fly fishing, the whole, whole mantra there is just matching the hatch and knowing what's going on on your rivers. Um, the Guadalupe River, really a phenomenal place because we do see a very wide range of insect sizes and species. Um, this is my personal favorite on the river just because that, there's nothing about that mayfly except that it wears this giant sign that says, Eat Me, all over it. I mean, that's what you need to know is that thing might as well have a blinking neon sign that says, Eat Me, because when the fish get put in the river, that's something that, you know, when they're used to eating pellets and stuff like that coming off the truck, you don't have to eat just too many of these to figure out that that's a lot of protein really fast. I don't know that firsthand. I'm just gathering that from information from the amount of trout that I actually catch on that fly. Uh, hexagenias, they're a beautiful bug. Uh, the hexagenia mayfly, or hex as it is commonly called, a lot of times is a nocturnal hatch. So a lot of times you see the hatch happen at night when most of us aren't out there fishing. Um, there are some days, at cloudy, rainy days, I see them pop off really well. And uh, this is typically the opposite. This is bluebird and sunny and then the fall. Uh, we start seeing them come off about this time of year on a fa fairly regular basis, and we do catch fish on this dry fly quite a bit. Um, Isonychius, slate winged drake, phenomenal pattern on the Guadalupe River. Uh, we typically fish the nymph form more than we fish the adult, but uh, really a beautiful bug. Uh, just be on the lookout because you never know what's coming off. When they're uh, little guys, that's what they look like. So uh, before they turn into that, they look like this. And so Isonychias, the slate winged drake, very important food source. Full range of sizes in the nymphs just because they do grow up in the uh, underwater. You also have scuds. You know, a lot of folks that are, uh, fish the White River and even the Lower Mountain Fork, as there's a lot of vegetation, uh, are familiar with scuds and sow bugs. Now, we don't really have any sow bugs on the Guadalupe River, but our scuds are really starting to rebound since the flood of 2002. 2002, we had uh, well over 100,000 cubic foot a second washed down the Guadalupe River and scoured the river bottom of all vegetation, turned all the rocks over, and washed away homes and everything uh, in its path. And now we're starting to see a lot of the vegetation come back, rebound, and as a result, we're seeing a lot more scuds in the river. Other mayflies, uh, we have all sorts of types. So, I mean, we have from big to small, everything in between. Uh, this is just an early, uh, we have a little lighter phase March Brown than some. Uh, that's what it looks like when you have uh, those guys sitting on the bottom of the river all uh, legged up and beefy. When you see rubber legs on your nymphs, that's what they're trying to imitate. Uh, he's got some cute little eyes there. I don't think I'd want to see a bigger version of that. <laughs> Blue wing olives, one of the mainstays of every trout fishery, especially on your blustery, rainy, nasty days. The nastier the day, the more likely those things are going to hatch off. Uh, and when you see these, they're not very large. Uh, that's actually taken against my waders. And if you can see the weave on Gore-Tex, that's a tiny fly. So that's one of the things that that's probably about a size 20, 22 right there. So not a really big bug, but at the same time, I really do watch for these because the trout go nuts over them. Um, if you ever are seeing trout rise and can't determine what they're rising on, there's really three possibilities. You have emergers where they're kind of swirling right into the surface. You have midges that are so dadgum small you couldn't see them anyway. Or three, you've got blooming olives that blend in perfectly with the surface of the water when you're looking down on them. If you'll put the sun away from you and take a knee down in the water and look across the water surface, if you see a bunch of little sailboats coming down the river that are about size 20, uh, that's blooming olives right there. And you can bet that you'll have a really good day fishing dry fly uh, in certain sections of the river. Light Cahills, my personal favorite mayfly on the Guadalupe River. The hex definitely warrants my attention when it's off, but I just can't find a more beautiful bug down there than that right there. And I don't know whatever caused me to think that bugs were good looking. That's not. If that got any larger than what they do, I don't think I'd wet weight ever again. Uh, San Juan worm, many of you are familiar with it. It actually is a real thing. That's an aquatic worm called an annelid, and we do have those all throughout the Guadalupe. And uh, don't worry, they don't like bore into your skin or anything like that. It's nothing, nothing that creepy. But when they do become dislodged, the trout do eat them, and you will have very, very good results fishing them. 
Caddisflies, a lot of people are very familiar with that. Caddisflies are God's gift to the fly fishermen. They absolutely suck at flying. They're just, they're terrible at it. They, are, they fly like Woodstock out of peanuts. So when, when they're doing loopy loops and flying all up and down and hitting the water and laying eggs, that just provokes plenty of fish to strike. And uh, we do have a lot of uh, caddis on the river, more of a tan caddis typically. That was more of a, a slate to a dark, almost a black there. But we have a lot of tans and creams on the river. Uh, caddis nymph there, uh, when you look through your fly tying materials and one says caddis green, and you're like, how on earth is there any bug out there that color? Well, I promise you they do look like that, and that's one right from the bottom of the river there. Interesting little tidbit of information. We do not have many stone flies on the Guadalupe River, but they are coming back. Um, I have, I've guided down there, I think this is going to be my eighth season of guiding down there, and i fished it even longer than that. And I have only seen stoneflies above Canyon Lake uh, of any sort of occurrence at all. And this year, I actually ran, this past season, I ran into about five different hatches of these guys, all same type, all same size. Uh, but we are starting to see those become a little bit more frequent. So I hope as we have uh, more consistent water flow, maybe a little bit of, uh, we'll probably have some floods here and there. But when those populations start coming back like that, you can bet the trout will start keying on them once we get a little bit higher numbers. So that's not a, you know, that's more of an up and coming, not a real matter of great importance, but it is very, very exciting to see them back on the river as they denote very clean water in the river itself. Different dry fly, fly patterns that I'll use to imitate different insects, that light Cahill that we were looking at earlier, uh, you know, just basically a deer hair body Cahill that we tie. Um, you know, very popular pattern for me. Uh, this is my skating hex pattern that I love fishing on the river simply because it's made out of CDC, deer hair, and hackle. You cannot drown that fly even if you tried. That thing is client proof. So <laughs> that one you can literally take it, you drown think, it. Do you think the apes might have used that fly? It is possible. They probably used it as a food I bet source. You Bigfoot, you know, especially like this. It's actually tied with Bigfoot hair for the tail, so <laughs> very, very limited supply. You have to go to Oklahoma and Arkansas to really harvest it. Uh, or the woods of East Texas. We're starting to see a little bit more availability there. Uh, the red fox squirrel nymph in a rubber lake version. Very, very popular fly on the Guadalupe River. Um, in the west, I use it as a stone fly imitation. Down here, it works great as a March Brown or just a general attractor. A uh, phenomenal pattern uh, for what we do on the Guadalupe River, and it does catch just about everything in fins. We catch smallmouth on it, largemouth on it, trout, sunfish, everything in between. Uh, we've even had carp pick it up, so it really does a great job of uh, imitating a variety of insects and attracting a variety of fish. A skating caddis, uh, once again, I use a lot of CDC in my tying. Those that know me at, <laughs> know me at all know that I use a lot of CDC. Um, simply for its waterproofing properties. That little skating caddis you're able to keep on top of the water, skitter it across, and so when you have times the trout really do not want to stare at a dry fly and sip it, a lot of times I'll powder this thing up with floating and skitter it right across the top of the water, and it really does exactly what you would do in bass fishing, trying to warrant a reaction strike, where they don't really strike because they're hungry, they don't really strike because they like it, they just want to eat something and it's moving away from them and that's just what they got to do is get it before it gets away. Uh, and a lot of times we will have very, very good luck uh, skating these in certain section, sections of the river that are about two to three feet and really clear. Other fly patterns, you have the San Juan worm. Uh, this is kind of one of those, not a whole lot to see here. It's very simple. If you can't tie one of these, uh, go to a beginner fly tying class. I promise you, you will come out with your first San Juan worm. <laughs> <laughs> Midges of any size, shape, and color, preferably smaller, 20s, 22s, 18 if the water's off color. Uh, I favor darker colors like dark olives, browns, charcoals, blacks. Uh, and then if you throw a little emerger wing, a little white emerger wing, that always helps your cause. Um, those midge emergers really do warrant a lot of attention on the Guadalupe River. And a lot of folks think that hatchery trout really are fairly undiscerning when it comes to flies, that they'll just eat absolutely anything. You give those fish about three days of looking at woolly buggers winging past them all day, uh, they, they start adapting to a, a very, very small diet after that. I've actually seen fish run from streamers on the Guadalupe River just because they get so used. Um, everybody's familiar fishing bass and sunfish. It's what we do in the hill country in North Texas and East Texas. It's bass and sunfish. Trout are not our usual target. So when we fish them like bass and sunfish, trout will get conditioned to that very, very quickly. Now in certain sections of the river, they will still eat streamers, but they're going to be the fish that are not targeted very often, that are in really, really deep water, or on different edges and break lines. Sadly, this is probably the best attractor on the Guadalupe River, and it's very offensive to any purist to have that in a box. Thankfully, I'm not a purist, so I'm more interested in getting you on fish. 
the egg pattern, while we could try to justify it and say, well, we're imitating sucker eggs, or, you know, when the trout come out of the hatchery, sometimes they hit the river and they're dropping eggs and ready to spawn, you can justify that. Whatever makes you sleep at night, that's fine. The point is, they like these things, and it gets their attention, and when they see one of those, and, and, and that's my favorite color, something like a fluorescent orange or kind of a light yellow, it's by far my top producer on the river, and fish them small, fish them in 18s. A lot of folks come down with a production tied egg that's somewhere between a 12 and a 14 and you've got this giant pom-pom of an egg going down the river. They see a handful of those and they turn off pretty fast. We're able to keep fish eating these consistently on about a size 18. Coincidentally, when you tie an egg that matches about a size 18 hook, it's about the size of a natural trout egg. So they don't get conditioned to them as quickly. Uh, also, if you want to play a really dirty trick on the mountain for next time you're up there, fish one of those in a size 20 and uh, you will catch fish around everyone that you are standing next to. You don't have to tell them what you're using. Just, just do it and say, yeah, you know, I made this last night. So do something like that. Uh, another dry fly pattern I very much like for blue wing olive patterns. Uh, this is one of mine, I call it the turducken. And uh, those of you that uh, are familiar with Cajun food, you know the, the history of the turducken, the fact that it is a turkey stuffed with a duck stuffed with a chicken. Well, the tail of this is chicken, the body is turkey, and the CDC plume right there is duck. So we figured if all of it's in there, we may as well uh, go back to the Cajun roots, as my mom's maiden name was Leje. So we just decided we'd call the fly the turducken. Yeah. With this, the main note here is pay attention to the river banks. Look at spider webs, check branches, rattle some trees around or some bushes, see if anything flies out of them. A lot of these insects, they'll hatch off and they'll get to the first piece of foliage they can find and rest up until they're ready to mate. Uh, we've got a little spinner mayfly here thanks to the clear wings. But a lot of times you'll see different forms of these insects in the bushes and trees and stuff like that than what you're going to see hatching off the water as many of these mayflies hatch off in the done stage and then make their way to the surrounding plant life. This would be a representation of a fish and what they look like when they make it through the year. That is not your typically typical off the truck stalker right there. That fish has made it a full summer, at least one full summer in the Guadalupe River and is very well fed, very well built and one of the most beautiful fish I've come by on the river. This fish is kind of interesting, and I know this is going to totally sound like a guide story, but I promise you I can back it up. I caught that fish, that single fish, four different times in a calendar year. And that calendar year ranged from June of, I want to say it was 2011, all the way through February of 2012. So I caught him twice in the summer, once in the fall, and once in the uh, very tail end of winter of the following year. Um, had a very unique spotting pattern on his opposite side, and when I zoomed in on the photos, you can it, it's just like a birthmark. Those stay with them for life. And so I was able to go back in and track that fish, and I caught him in probably a you know, 100, 150 yard stretch of river where that fish, you know, you got to see him. He started out as kind of a fat, chubby fish, really leaned down, muscled up, uh, to where the last time I caught him, the, the, I mean, the colors on him were just astounding. And you got to watch the fish actually change uh, in the environment as he took on a natural diet, and it was really a lot of fun to watch and record. Now that's not your everyday occurrence on the Guadalupe River. So lest we have anyone in the room that says they don't spawn, they don't reproduce, they don't do that in Texas, they all die in the summer, that is August 28th of last year. And that is a naturally spawned rainbow trout out of the Guadalupe River. Texas Parks and Wildlife doesn't usually stock a trout that small. They may slip one in every now and then that's pushing that, but they don't stock them that small. The other thing is, is if they do, they're going to stock them in the winter. The latest stockings are typically in January. Those little trout feed voraciously and put on length fast. When the name of the game in the animal kingdom is get as big as you can, as fast as you can, so you're not lunch tomorrow, that is the idea behind this little guy. Is they're putting on length really quick. This little fish, totally different coloration than the ones we get out of the trucks. Uh, beautiful fins. You can see the white tip already on his uh, anal fin there. Gorgeous, gorgeous trout. And what was that? Did he have coddle? <laughs> no. <laughs> so with this, I had the, the thing that I was really interesting. Uh, the, I'm sorry. I, I might have misunderstood that question. I thought you I said, did he have a collar? I was like, no. What was the? Did he have the coddle fin? You know, the, the, the stock of the coddle. Oh, 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 the adipose, the, the, the little nubby fin there, yes, they, they do have that. We don't clip them on the, on the stalkers anymore. All of them have the adipose when they come out of the truck. Um, so if you catch a fish, it'll usually have the adipose. They try clipping them one year. It's just a lot of work and a lot of fish handling. Uh, it was just better to get them in the river faster. But, yeah, this little guy, perfect specimen. Everything about him was just right. even has his little bandit mask right in his eye. As we see more catch and release and better practices, we're going to see more fish like that that, you know, 
whether this fish made it through a summer, whether it came off a truck as a you know retired brooder fish, it doesn't matter. The thing, the point is, you are going to see more fish like that throughout the fishery as a result of good, I mean, really good catch and release, good fishing practices, and awareness on the river. Uh, that fish last year, we take that one out. It was between 26, 27 inches. Uh, very, very large male. We sight for. I mean, you can see how deep the water we're standing in. We actually sight fish that fish, and it chased a streamer out. And uh, that gentleman's all the way from Japan, fished two days with me last year, and uh, got to fight that fish in on a four weight. So uh, that, that took a little bit. It, we, we landed that fish in, I think, just under six minutes. Uh, this fish here, once again, very fat female, you know, loaded with eggs, great looking fish. You're going to see a lot of this. And uh, coincidentally, this is taken just about the same place from a year prior. Uh, if you'll notice, we're kneeling also in very, very shallow water in the same spot where that other fish was taken. Um, these fish, we do see fish, you know, occur in very similar places year after year after year. And uh, I have fished the river this summer several times, and we do see holdover fish all throughout the river, but especially in the upper five miles. Let's talk just a little bit about catch and release. And this is something really near and dear to my heart as, you know, a trout guide and as, you know, really a conservationist and something that really GRTU really encourages folks to do is to learn catch and release, learn how to do it right. These aren't, uh, these aren't flathead catfish that you can throw in the back of the truck, drive across town and put in your stock tank. These, uh, a trout, you've done permanent damage to his gills with 10 to 12 seconds out of the water. And that's, that's I mean, if you count that down and you just one 1,000, two 1,000, you know, that, that's a long time. I mean, that, that really is a long time out of the water. So the thing that I really encourage people to do is when you're taking <coughs> pictures of fish, keep them in the water as much as you can. Uh, you know, pictures like this, you know, I really enjoy showing the fish off, but that fish's head is under the water. His gills are still pumping. Everything's still good with him. Uh, and that's something that especially in the summer months, when you're taking pictures of fish, if you lift them out of the water at all, you're really, I mean, the mortality on a trout typically is water temperatures above 70 degrees. So when you hit that 70 degree threshold and you expose them to 100 degrees up here and then back in the water again in 70, that's a pretty major shock. You think about you walking in and out of your house. Uh, you know, we take it a little better. These trout, they're a little bit more sensitive. Now, for me, do I have an issue with somebody, you know, lifting up real fast, getting a picture and dropping it back in? You know, that's your discretion. I would encourage you as much as possible, take pictures of fish that are in the water or touching the water or something. Because for one, if you mishandle it, the worst thing that's possibly going to happen is it swims off just fine. And that's what we're really aiming for. In the summertime, that's really not when you want to get all your photo ops of, you know, up here gripping grins. That's where you want to take all your pictures in the water or in the net, stuff like that where you can really see your fish, uh, you know, against the backdrop and things like that. If you're looking for your real big gripping grins, that's really where to do that in the wintertime or cooler months, just where it's easier on the fish. Um, with the advent of affordable underwater cameras and digital photography, you can take as many pictures as you want and you can mess up as many times as you want. And occasionally you'll get a pretty fun photo like that. Uh, you know, and you'll even get some really neat underwater photos as you release them, stuff like that. That's a lot of fun. Those are great pictures, and to me, I actually enjoy I would much rather put that on a wall than my smiling mug holding that thing. So th just the art behind fish photography and also the, the ease of doing so. Uh, you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on a camera. Uh, I think some of the top-of-the-line waterproof just, you know, adventure cameras right now are like 275 250 300 That's really not a whole lot of money for a camera that you can dunk underwater, expose it in the rain, or anything like that. Um, but with these fish, a bass, they have this really nice bottom lip that we can stick our thumbs in, hold it up, you know, get our picture. You know, you see the tournament guys, they just flip them right off the boat, not a problem. They're happy as a lark. Trout, it's really important that you revive a fish that you've played to exhaustion. And to revive a fish properly, we simply just cradle the front of the fish. Your front hand is not really for squeezing. When you're doing this, Everything you do with trout is a loose grip. To cradle it, all you do is just keep it in the front right there, head under the water, watch those gills pump. And I see a lot of free, uh, people first time releasing a fish, they'll move their hand all the way up on the gills, and that fish is sitting there with its gills shut going, would you just like please pull your fingers from out of my nose is essentially what they're asking you to do. I mean, it's the same thing as putting your hand and uh, fingers up their nose and over their mouth. It's the same thing. So make sure their gills are ready to go and that they're pumping and they're breathing good and they're facing into the current. Uh, I see a lot of people, they feel like they have to rock their fish like crazy to revive it. Just let him sit there and be happy for a little bit. If there's no current, a soft rocking doesn't really hurt the fish. But I see some people washboarding these things, and I'm like, man, it's just a fish. You know, just give the guy a break. Um, the best place to hold a trout when you are actually um, handling a fish like this, 
the front hand is simply for cradling purposes. Don't squeeze there simply because you'll really harm the internal organs and things like that. Uh, you do run the risk of doing so. The other thing is, is when you're going to grip, grip with your other hand that's right in front of the tail. And uh, if you have ever taken any lessons in fish anatomy, that narrow section right before the caudal fin or the tail is called the caudal peduncle. I don't know why. I didn't name it that. And if you ever tell a fish it has a nice peduncle, I won't hold it against you. <laughs> but with that, make sure that you keep these guys in the water as much as possible. And, uh, you know, just get some great shots. I mean, it's digital photography. Waste your film. You know, shots like that where that fish is ready to swim off, he's ready to go. Uh, that fish, as much as I can keep him in the water or even out of my hands, the better it is for him. And that's one of the things that we really stress is just making sure that we have good catch and release tactics and techniques. Barbless hooks help. They're easier to get out of you. They're easier to get out of the fish. As a guide, we really appreciate that. Uh, I had a person a couple years ago, they were in the boat, and they missed a hook set. Two nymphs, an indicator, and two split shot were headed right at the face. And uh, I don't even flinch anymore. I just look down. And both the guys almost jumped off the boat. And he looks at me and goes, is anybody hurt? And that thing, I've got one hook here and one hook here and split shot. And I think I'm looking at the indicator. It was sitting on my nose. And I was like, no, nobody's hurt. Just me. We're good. So as long as I'm the casualty, we're okay. But with that, the Guadalupe River very much warrants your attention. It's, one of the, uh, it's ranked as one of the 100 best trout streams in the U.S., whether or not I believe that or not is irrelevant, it made it in the book. So <laughs> I think there's uh, probably a hundred more that I could probably put on the list before that. But as it pertains to Texas, the reason it got the ranking is the fact that it is the southernmost, it's the only, and quite frankly, it's a very interesting location for a tailwater trout fishery. And it does have the ability to persist and exist for you know, years at a time. I mentioned that we had a new regulation change on the river, and many of you that have fished the river before are familiar with the fact that we have a trophy zone where you can keep one trout over 18 inches and it has to be caught on fly or lure only. If that trout is obtained using salmon, eggs, cheese, or any other grocery item, you have to return it to the water no matter how big it is. This year, as of September 1st, Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, I, in my opinion, made one of the greatest calls uh, for the Guadalupe River that could ever be done, and that is the upper section of the river from 800 yards below the dam all the way down to mile four, which is the beginning of the trophy zone, there is now a new regulation in place for this year. And that regulation is that now all trout between 12 and 18 inches have to be returned to the water. All of them. Doesn't matter any method. It doesn't matter bait, spin, or fly. Doesn't matter. You can keep five trout, but only one of those five can be above 18 inches. And all of those five have to be obtained on artificial lures. That may sound complicated. If you're a catch and release angler like myself, you don't even give a rip. You just throw everything back in the water anyway. But for the longevity of the fishery, it is the best move possible because now you're going to see more holdovers. You're going to see more fish in the river on a regular basis. You will see fish over summer in that upper four, five, six miles of river. And uh, if we get some rain, I mean, I've got to find some wood to knock on, but if we get some rain one of these days, you will see this river take off. Uh, 2010, there was, uh, we had the low flow agreement kick in on the Guadalupe River, and that simply means that Guadalupe Blanco River Authority releases a minimum of 200 cubic foot of water out of the dam uh, throughout the summer months. We had an average of three to 400 cubic foot a second coming down the river, and on July 5th, my buddy Matt and I went down there, and between us, we caught almost 40 trout. Over half of those were on dry. That's incredible. July 5th, to be standing in 60 something degree water catching, I mean, and our average fish was between 16 and 18 inches. When you're catching those on hopper patterns in Texas, it's a good day. And it's a very rare day. So if you ever get the chance to summertime fish the Guadalupe River in high flows, uh, if we see a year like that, I'm not going to get a whole lot of work done because that's pretty much all I'm going to do. A um, little bit about what we do as a guide. Obviously, we have to float the river a lot of times. Uh, the river is completely weight fishable. Uh, especially in lower flows, there are very few spots that really demand the use of a boat, but it does help you get from point A to point B. If you have a kayak, this is a great river for it, uh, using it mainly for transportation uh, and not as much to fish out of. But with the raft, we're able to keep a stable platform, keep you standing or sitting all day as you prefer, and it uh, really allows us to do things like this where we can drop anchor. Uh, you can see that we're kind of sitting on the shallower side of things, fishing up against those cypress roots. And, uh, man, just the beauty of this river, I mean, seeing cypress roots crawling up a rock bank like that, something that you don't see a whole lot. And uh, I had some friends from Colorado down, and they were like, hey, could you get me a, my picture with this fish? And, like, and I said, you just want the fish this angle? He said, no, 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 I want the cypress trees in the background. I was like, 
well, they're everywhere. He goes, I know, but you just don't see tr trout and cypress anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those things that they just thought that was the neatest thing in the world to have cypress trees and trout, because normally it's something we associate with like a Caddo Lake or something like that. But a uh, little bit about what we do as a fly shop. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in here, and thank you so much for those of you that have uh, come through town to stop by. Uh, we do have living water fly fishing in Round Rock, Texas. Uh, we're more than happy to show you our rivers and give you the info that you need to go do it yourself. Uh, and if you want to book us, that's fine. But, you know, we understand that there's a lot of people that like do-it-yourself fly fishing, and I'm one of those people. Uh, so if you're coming in, we'll hook you up with the flies that you need. And uh, we really appreciate y'all's support of the shop. We hear a lot of great press coming from up here. Um, but we tell every club this that we go to, before you shop with us, support your local fly shop. And I cannot stress that enough. If you've got fly shops in town, and I know you do, uh, and you know who they are, and if you don't, then go look it up. The important thing is to support your local fly shops. Keep your talent here. That's what keeps this sport alive is clubs like this, fly shops like that, and really inter introducing that to the next generation of anglers, whether they're 8 years old or 80 years old, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, really seeing this sport thrive is dependent on places like this, uh, like this club meeting and fly shops such as ours and many others across the state. And uh, great fly shops, anybody can sell you stuff. I mean, we, we proved that a long time ago in America. Anybody can sell stuff. But not everyone can teach. If you find a fly shop that's willing to teach you and share info, support them with everything you've got. And, uh, and that's coming from a fly shop owner, not just the importance I know it carries for my shop, but everyone that's out there today. And so uh, when you travel places, stop in, ask the info, buy a few flies. I do it. I, do it. I, I own a fly shop, and I spend more money in Colorado on flies than I need to just because I want to keep them there because that means the world to me, and I know it means the world to the sport. So if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to call us. We're happy to answer and don't feel like you have to buy something from us. Uh, with that, are there any questions? Yes? Tell me, how many years did it take before the fly club with the 5,000 members how long did it take for those boys to convince the state to release that minimum flow? So it has nothing to do with the state. It has everything to do with the Guadalupe Blanco Guadalupe. River Authority. And being that GRTU, the one thing that GRTU has going for it is that it's not a fly fishing club. It's a conservation chapter. Uh, so the one thing that they're able to do is being that they are a direct representation of TU, they have a lot more uh, power when it comes to going into court and fighting for things like that. They have a legal defense fund that basically allows them to fund that sort of operation. And it did take years. Yeah, yes. Through your influence, you should convince those boys to get on the Brazos River case and get rid of the golden algae up there, <laughs> which they're not, the guy was here, he, they had a 10-year study from, from the Texas Park and Wildlife, he said they just take them, they didn't look at it, they didn't give a damn, and that river up there is dead in the doornail, and it was one of the best rivers you could, you could catch 100 fish a day, and now, with no power plant at PK, they don't release any water except the water they sell for irrigation when they get the money. That's what things like the Texas Council is for, is to help pioneer efforts like well, that. see if you can do use your influence. Yes, sir. Uh, what so the spread on percentage-wise of dry fly fishing and dip fishing on the, on the Guadalupe River? So a lot of people, the first few times I fished the Guadalupe River, uh, I went with some individuals that had fished it even longer than I had, and they said, just leave your dry fly box at home. And the first two times I did it, I, I left my dry fly box at home, and I couldn't have been the, that, that was the worst decision I could have ever made. It is not a dry fly fishery primarily. I would say you're looking at 70 plus percent of your river is very much nymph driven in the sense of it is a tailwater fishery. It's midge and subsurface. However, I think it actually has more to do with location than it does really availability. There are certain sections on the river, and if you, if you know the river at all or have questions of where those at, I'd be happy to share them with you uh, if you're interested in going and doing it on dry. Um, but there are certain sections where I can reliably, just about any day of the year that, you know, that is you know, obviously decent trout weather, can go and get fish on dry fly on the Guadalupe River. So that, it is something that I would consider still a mainstay. It can always be done. It's just where it is done that I feel like it's important. Uh, for the easiest place to access, would be the third crossing. Uh, Action Angler, great fly shop down there on the river. Uh, Chris Jackson owns that shop. Quality, quality guy, an excellent guide. Um, very, very good friend of mine. His access there, if you want to access through his property, it's five bucks, you hop in. There are rising fish in that stretch of river due to the fact that it's crystal clear 
and usually not over about three feet deep. So it forces them to look up. I, I mean, I've been down there floating through there and seen 100 rises on my way through. So very, very common. So yeah, ex excellent question, but it can be done. Yes, sir? When's the best time? I know you can fish year round, but when's the best time to fish? Best time would be uh, mid-November through about March is re re really where we see that. We will trout fish all the way into April and still guide some. By the, by the end of April, we're already starting to flirt with warmer temperatures a little bit. It just depends on water flow and year. Um, the main thing would be uh, in the summer months, you have to carry your water thermometer. I cannot stress that enough, and I almost forgot to mention that. If that thing shows its button up next to 70 degrees, it's time for you to go upriver to chase trout where the water's cooler, or you switch over to bass and sunfish. Um, but the summertime is more of kind of the novelty of it, not the mainstay of the fishery. I think we will see that change over the years. Um, but, I mean, I've had plenty of great trout days where we had a very decent representation of trout with highs in the upper 90s, low 100s. Uh, but, yeah, November, that, that mid to late November through about March is peak season. So, anybody else? Other questions? Yes? Uh, the trout that uh, makes it through the summer, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person, I like to eat fish. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do the fish down there that survive the warmer temperatures compare to the fish that you might get out of Colorado and stay in cold water all the time? Okay. Um, I have no idea because I've never eaten one. So, <laughs> but uh, with that, I mean, for for me as a GRTU lease uh, member, I waive my right to keep any fish on the river just out of out of the regulations that GRTU puts on us as conservationists. If you choose to eat it, it's well within your legal right. Um, typically, those fish do not get caught very often, um, so it's one of those things that they're usually a little bit more selective. So finding somebody that actually is caught and eating a holdover fish, it's very rare. Uh, with, the, with the fact that we've had so many low water years, it used to be a lot more common uh, when we had higher flows of like four to 500 on average, but we just don't have that anymore. So, I mean, I'm sure they taste great, but then again, they're also $5 a pound at HEB. <laughs> Anybody else? Those are good questions. Yes? What would you say your go-to fly is year-round? Would it be that little black midge you were talking about? If I had one rig to fish on the Guadalupe River, it's going to be that little orange egg in an 18 with about 10 to 12 inches of line hanging off the back end of it, drop into that little bitty black midge. That right there is, if you just want to tie that on and fish it till you can't fish it anymore, you will have more success on that rig than just about anything you throw out there. The key to that is the midge needs to be about a size 20 to 22, and the egg needs to be about a size 16 to 18. I prefer the lower end. What size leader do you use? 5X. Uh, you can use 4. Use yeah, on, I use that all the way through the rig. I prefer 5X all the way through. Some people like 4X. If you're going to fish streamers, it's not, you know, if you're going to use fluorocarbon, you can go up to 2 and 3X. That's not an issue. But for all of my nymph fishing, I typically use 5X fluorocarbon. So, good questions. Anybody else? Those are all good questions. All right, going once. Yeah, one more time in the back. And say, what is the access down there? I've been there a couple of times. I'm a member of the RTU. Sure. Um, but I'm not, I don't know the least access, but my friend is. We have visitors pass. Mm -hmm. We go to numerous places. It seems a little tricky to get in by yourself without such access. Okay, so a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of the lease access sites, not all, but a lot of them are actually like tube outfitters and things like that and campgrounds along the river. If you go and literally either knock on their door or show up, most of them have little general stores that when you pull in, you can go to the general store uh, and they'll just charge you a little day fee, typically somewhere between five and seven bucks. I think the highest one on the river is I think 10. Um, but a lot of those, like the, the two mains I would say is like whitewater sports. You can wade, I want to say it's like, almost two miles a river from that access point, up and down. Um, Rio Raft, same story. You can wade well over two miles a river up and down from it in low water conditions like we have right now. Rio's five bucks, I think Whitewater's 10, Lazy l and I think is seven. So I mean, if you take a 20 down there, you can go fish more, more water than you'd need to in a day. So if you're only gonna make it down a time or two a year, then it's probably not worth doing the lease access. However, uh, the one thing about lease access is that all that, for the most part, most of that money, I won't say all because some goes to pay the landowners and lease owners, but most of that money goes directly into stocking the fish that you're catching. So for those of you that are interested in joining the program, as a guide, I don't need to join, but I join it every year. My wife and I sign both of us up just simply because I make my living off that fishery and I want to support putting fish back in the river. Uh, I just think it's the right thing to do, whether or not it's necessary or not, uh, you know, you can make that call. But for me, I just want to support the fishery however I can. Yes, sir.
How much fish do you guys stock through the program? That's actually a really good question. It changes from year to year simply because we have some years where there's higher water. Uh, typically, we do three stockings. I want to say it's like 1,500 to 2,000 fish a stocking, something like that, uh, spread up and down the river. Now, those fish are typically larger. They're typically an average size of about 16 inches, so they are bigger fish. So the count is down, but the size is high. And given the size of the Guadalupe River and the amount of fishing pressure, I did the math one time. In certain sections of the river, you're floating over 1,500 fish a mile with thanks to Texas Parks and Wildlife and GRTU's combined efforts. So, yeah, you have a lot of them in there. Yes, sir? Where did those fish come from? That's a great question, and thank you. I forgot to mention that, and uh, we'll wrap up after this. So, those fish come from Crystal Lake Fisheries uh, out of Missouri. And in talking with Crystal Lake Fisheries, one of the very uh, uncommonly known things about those fish is they're actually called the Emerson strain of rainbow trout. Now, the Emerson strain is bred for one purpose, and that is to be very temperature tolerant. In talking with the guys at Crystal Lake Fisheries, I was just absolutely astounded to learn that they did temperature trials on a few of these fish, and some of the select specimens weathered water temps up to 82 degrees if they drop it back down in the mid to lower 70s at night. Now, 82 degrees is what most of our rivers get around here in the summertime. Like, Brushy Creek is probably 80 to 82 in the summer. To think of these trout that in that, that's, that's a warm water fishery temperature, and these fish could actually make it through the year as long as it was just for brief periods. And I thought that was absolutely incredible. So you hear this 70 degree mortality. So when you're watching the temperature gauges on GRTU's website, it goes up to 75, and you're like, oh, all the fish are dead. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Those fish get right on the bottom, right where the springs come in, or they're in that, I mean, because a lot of times you're reading surface temps and things like that with your temperature thermometer. So when you see 70 on your thermometer, it's time for you to leave because it's hot. But those fish are still just fine down there on the bottom. So. Uh, I'll tell you what, I caught a 16-inch rainbow on the Medina River on a bass line. It does happen. That yeah. happens on the Blanco, too. And, and my guy, I thought my friend was going to fall out of the boat. He got so excited. <laughs> I didn't do it. I said, my God, it's a rainbow. And it was on a, you know, on a stream. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Chris, is that the same uh, strain of uh, rainbow trout that is uh, like... Uh, uh, immune to worrying disease as well? I don't know if that's the same strain there. I doubt it. Um, it. It may have some of those traits, but I doubt it. I don't know it specifically, so I can't really answer that one. The one thing that, um, and, and I mean, there's differing views on this depending on who you ask, but with the Lower Mountain Fork River, they used to get all their rainbow trout from Crystal Lake Fisheries, but they were apparently outbid by some hatchery in Nebraska. I, I've had differing opinions on both. Some people say that the new fish fight a lot harder and that they do a great job and all this stuff. Man, I just, I like I liked the look of those Emerson strain. They really color up nice, and especially when you have a summertime runoff in the lower mountain fork. I mean, we were there a couple weeks ago, and water temperatures got above 70, even though the daytime temps really were not that hot. Yes, sir? I think they're using a combination of Emerson and the Bill For lower mountain fork? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Based on the time of year, okay. the That's fantastic. I didn't know that. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Yes. Chris, I learned last year at Rio Rap that um, they have an agreement with Texas Parks and Wildlife. I can't remember whether it's 10 or 15 people are allowed into fish every day, um, fee free. Okay. So there's and, uh, access okay. there um, as long as you're an early fisherman. Okay. And I. I remember that Texas Parks and Wildlife, they actually did three leases up and down the river. I don't know if they renewed all those. Are the, is the Rio Raft one still current? I don't know. Okay, because I know that they did one at Mountain Breeze, Rio Raft, and Whitewater for a while. Uh, so if those are up for renewal or if they're renewed this year, you might call Rio Raft and check. But, yes, if they're still doing that, that's a great program because that's fantastic water. And if you can get on it free of charge, awesome. And kudos to TPNW. All right. Well, I'll let you all get on to your meeting. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it.